Thank you for clicking on this video and today what I'm going to share with you is the full Flutter app development cycle. So another word for it is a mobile app development cycle. So this is the summary that we are going to go through. It is a lot to build and maintain an app that is brought to many, many users. So just a disclaimer, this is what I think happens inside a Flutter app development lifecycle from my experience as a software developer. Pause this video to read the whole contents. So let's get started. The app development cycle or life cycle is normally termed as software development cycle. So it is where a continuous process that get from an initial idea or feature to be released in software. So if you have worked in a company before, either a startup or a big tech company, usually there is a software development life cycle or we call it SDLC. However, different companies have different SDLC. So some is shorter and smaller because the company is focused on releasing the first version of the app. While these companies have shortened SDLC are usually startups or small companies. While other companies or bigger companies have a longer and meticulous SDLC process as quality is very, very important and they are able to afford the different processes to different people. Like I say, this can be found in big tech team and large IT or tech companies. So I'm going to share an SDLC that I think is thorough and the processes you should focus or ignore according to the circumstances. So the first one usually starts at the problem statement. This is usually when you start out your first app. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Let's have an example of a to-do app. The problem statement is that you probably cannot bring your whiteboard around to check on your to-dos. I'm not going into details of what the whole problem statement concept is. However, most of the time, you'll start with the problem. And this problem statement does not necessarily come from you. This means you might have an existing app. Moreover, you see a recurring problem statement found in the comments section or review section of your app. Usually, you will need the developer account for the App Store for Apple and developer account for the Play Store for Android. For example, the current to-do app has no delete all button and a lot of people are requesting this feature. So you might think that you want to prioritize this feature in the next build, which comes to my next point. Prioritize. If you have a popular app that has tens or hundreds of comments weekly, then you expect that there will be feature or even bugs that you have to fix. Let's say you have five features requests that you have collected from last week. Which requests should you start on doing? This will largely depend on what you are prioritizing. If you are prioritizing user experience, which I assume most of us will, then you will try to fix any bugs that users has faced. After you have fixed the bugs, then I assume that the product owner will prioritize what feature to be pushed in the next build. Factors that affect the decision is number of people requesting the feature, campaigns that have already been set up, and the direction of the product or the roadmap. So the tools that facilitate this prioritization is those Kanban board inspired software, such as Trello and Jira. Therefore, you'll be tasked with tasks in this software to keep you track on your to-dos or tasks. So once a priority is set, then the feature will be brought to the designer that will take the idea and transform it into visuals, animations, and user flow. If your team does not have a user experience or UX designer, then your user interface or UI designer will take on the role as the UX designer. If there is no UI or UX designer, 
then either someone else will do the design, usually the product owner, or you, the developer, would handle the design. In my experience, I'll probably have to wait the design to be finished. Therefore, I work on the lower hanging fruits of the tasks that I have, or I will recommend you guys to refactor your code. Because once you document it and make it more readable, you will save a lot of time when you have a bug in a file that you have not touched for a very long time. Once the design is up, it is usually handled inside a design software. I worked with InVision and I really like it. Other tools used for handing over design to code are Sketch, Adobe XD, Zeppelin, Figma. This is where you can find the app screens that you need to create. These tools usually have measurement tools that help you code out the design accurately. Sometimes your designer has design guidelines that helps make the design looks consistent. However, once you have the design, this is when you start coding. And this is where most of you guys come in. And one thing that you have noticed when you're working with designers is that some of the things that your designer has created, you might think that you are not able to recreate it for many reasons. From my experience, Due to deadlines, I will tell the designer that I will not be able to recreate the actual design and I'll suggest a compromise. Luckily, the compromise will be agreed as design is usually a base on how the app should look like, not how the app should actually look like. However, in other companies, it might be different. Then you might ask questions on different use cases. What if the user chooses a birthday that's more than 100 years old? What if the user closed the app and opened the app again? Would you want the user to open the app with the screen previously opened? Should the user stay permanently logged in? Or should the user have a time limit of inactivity to be considered an auto logout? This is where you try to cover as many loopholes as possible and try out as many different situations as possible. So you go back and forth with the designer and also the product owner. And the tools that you usually use to communicate to your colleagues or stakeholders are Slack, Workplace, and Flocked. And there is tons of communication apps or software out there. Once you have finished coding, you got to test it out. Now, this depends on the company you are in. I've worked in a startup and testing means you manually open the production version of your app and test it out on a physical device. If your company has a practice on writing tests, then this is when you start writing tests. You might find a loophole or bug, and that is when you need to go back writing code. This cycle continues till your feature is working okay without any loopholes and bugs. Once your test is passed, whether physically or programmatically or both, then you will probably will do a pull request for a review. In the startup I worked for, they don't do code reviews as it slows down the process. However, in large companies, code reviews are a norm. This helps other people to look at your code and critique. If there was something that is not right or if the code does not make sense, the pull request will be denied and you have to do some corrections. So there will be some back and forth and this usually as a junior developer is a humbling experience that you will face and this will improve you as a developer. Once the comments looks good to me or LGTM is shown, then that means your pull request will be merged into the branch that you requested. It is usually the production or master branch. So once it's merged, then you will update the change log. So you'll probably need to tell what features you have added in the change log. This depends on how your workflow is. Sometimes there isn't a change log, so it depends. So once the documentation and update of change log is done, the next thing is to build the app file. So there are many ways to do this. 
First, you need to choose whether to release in both iOS or Android. And second, you need a developer account. In order for you to release an Android, you need to pay 25 bucks for a lifetime, while Apple has a yearly subscription of 99 bucks. Once you have the account, then you have to create the app file. For Apple, you need Xcode to do it. For Android, literally anything. Make sure you update your version number as this is a pain in the ass if you tried uploading the same version. And there is a lot of manual stuff that you have to do, like key signing, obfuscation, and minification to prevent anyone to, to reverse engineer your app, and many more. Once you have the app files, then you have to manually log in into the different developer account and upload your app files. This is really a lot of process. And if you're tired of manual work, then you can use a tool called Fastlane. So Fastlane is an open source tool that helps automate first your testing and second publishing of your apps. I would highly recommend you to do this. You can plug in the necessary things and processes in Fastlane like app signing, increment version number, and pushing into the App Store and Play Store automatically. One downside is that Fastlane requires a machine for you to do the automation. Another way is to use continuous integration or continuous delivery slash deployment service such as Codemagic and Bitrise. They support both iOS and Android deployment. This is when you will have a dashboard and website to add your private keys. The advantages of using these services is that they will use machines that they have bought or hosted in order for you to run the automation. So you don't have to run your automation in your own machine. And this will also help your testing and deployments. One thing to take note about these services are that they are paid. This depends on their service terms. However, Fastlane is free. So once you have pushed to the developer accounts in the App and Play Store, you can push to the beta testing of the different platforms. For iOS, they have this external app called TestFlight, where you are able to test the beta versions of apps. While Android, it is not a separate app, but is an inbuilt feature inside the Play Store. So you can add internal tests like your colleagues to test the app internally in your company. You can also add external testers like your friends, families, or users that is active and willing to be test subjects. This is your extra layer of testing. If any of these testers find a bug, then you have to try to either create a task to solve the bug. However, this depends on the severity of the bug. So once the beta tester feel like it's okay, the last gatekeeper, the manual or automated review by the App Store and Play Store team. Before you send the review to the respective platform team, this is when you are able to upload your screenshots or images in the respective platforms. Moreover, this is when you are able to update your description and write down any fixes if you have any. This can also be done automatically by Fastlane or some of the CI or CD services. Then once you added the necessary descriptions, images and selected the appropriate choices for your app, you will then click the review button. This will be either automated or manual testing by the respective team, the Play Store team or the App Store team. They will check whether your app follow the proper guidelines and they will test on many devices to see whether if there's any bugs. If you forget to check the box that you say that you have ads in your app or they found a bug in the iPhone SE or it does not fit any of the guidelines, you will see that your app review has been rejected. Personally, from my experience, Android review is pretty fast as it is mostly automated testing. 
while iOS is manual testing and it takes one day for them to review it. If, you are, if your review is rejected, you will receive a message of what's wrong. Sometimes it is a feature that does not fit the guideline. You can appeal or reply them back or they found a bug and you have to resolve it. Once your review is okay, celebrate because it feels like heaven. You can release it at a specific date or you can either manually release it at any point of time or you can release it once it is approved. So celebrate, grab another coffee and move on to the next task, which is error and download tracking. So I believe the both platforms have error tracking, which says how many devices crashed. This might be due to various reasons. If I'm not wrong, Android platform would show the error messages if an app crashed inside the Play Console. For iOS, I believe there isn't any error messages. And from my experience, and this might be subjective, there tends to be more app crashes found on Android than iOS. This is due to the nature of thousands of devices in the Android ecosystem. You can track your own errors using third-party services such as Sentry and Crashalytics by Firebase. Moreover, you can track the download and uninstall numbers in your respective platforms. On the left is the App Store or the iOS one, and on your right is the Google Play Console developer website. So that's about it. I hope I give you the bird's eye view of the whole software development lifecycle in building a mobile app using Flutter. So this level of overview is for people who have a tech team. If you are a sole developer with a popular app or if you are just a sole developer who wants to build an app, I believe this gives you some structure to your workflow. Remember, it is more than just building an app. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want more of this video, subscribe down below and comment down what processes or steps that I have missed out. So that's about it. Stay safe and all the best. Bye-bye.